Welcome to the weekly service from the Elim Church in the Home Valley. We're delighted that you've been able to join us on this occasion. And I know that tonight that we're going to be blessed. We're going to be encouraged by the Word of God that is going to change our lives and make us more like Christ. Amen. And you come with expectant hearts, ready to be encouraged, ready to be blessed, ready to, I don't know, just move on with God, to be inspired by the Word, to, to really catch hold of what God has got for you tonight. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, we lift the names of others that are close to us before you right now. And Father, we pray, may your love abound. May your grace abound. May your healing abound. May your peace abound. May each of them know a greater revelation of your love towards them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Gail. Amen. Good evening. This is Psalm 103, and it's the first five verses, slightly longer uh, section tonight. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. So that's a wonderful passage of scripture there. Now, we've entered um, Advent, and um, as we begin to think about the approaching Christmas season, let's do what the psalmist says and forget not all his benefits. Let's not get so caught up in Christmas shopping and decorating and planning and cooking that we forget the real reason for the season. Today's passage reminds us of some of the benefits that Jesus came to give us. Our sins are forgiven, that psalm says. Our diseases are healed. Our lives are saved from destruction and from the enemy. As Christians, we have the Holy Spirit living within us so that we can know God's love, his peace, his joy, and his grace. He is the Lord, our provider, satisfying us with good things. He restores and strengthens us each day so that we can soar on wings like eagles. Go back and meditate on the first five verses of Psalm 103. It's a really good passage to lift you up and let you see what God has for you. When we begin to focus on God and his goodness, we can't help but do what the psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. Let's do that as we worship him now.
God is not dark to you. Hello. Thank you, Lord, that you are the light and you are the life and you are the joy in our beings. Mm. That you have a secure future in your hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It may seem it's not dark to you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You are wonderful, counsellor, mighty God. You are Prince of Peace, our Father forevermore. The Alpha, the Omega, Lord of all lords. You are wonderful, counsellor, mighty God. Hallelujah.
going to ask Al in a moment or two just to sing that last verse again. Be still for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. He comes to cleanse and to heal and to minister his grace. And I, I want to encourage the, you that as, as we sing this verse again, that you just believe for that which you need tonight. Maybe you've got an ache and a pain. I want to encourage you just to put your hand on that ache or pain that you've got. And as we sing this song, receive God's healing to your body this evening. Receive his strength, receive his power, because no work is too hard for him. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Gal. Father, I pray that your grace, your healing, your power would abound, would flow. Thank you, Jesus. You're a good God who doesn't treat us as we deserve, but treats us according to your son, Jesus. Not according to the law, but according to grace. Not according to how good we are or how bad we are, but according to the goodness of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So it was a big event on Thursday. Unfortunately, Gal and I were away and we missed the big event. Uh, um, David and Kath got married at the town hall, Tuesday, one o'clock, and they are now husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. David Taylor. And we want to extend our congratulations to them. And um, I understand it all went well. There was a nice gathering there and the Lord's presence was very powerful there. Father, thank you that even in their senior years, they can enjoy the, the, the happiness and the gladness of being married. And we want to pray for David and Kath right now that they would enjoy many years together. Father, marriage is a picture of Christ's love for the church. And I, Father, that your love would then be demonstrated throughout this marriage and it would be a witness to the community around. It would be a witness to their family, a witness to the neighbours, a witness to their friends. And Father, I pray that in their marriage that your name would be glorified. Everybody who meets them would know that they love you. Father, I pray that you would give David wisdom in his senior years, uh, Lord Jesus, to be that husband that you have called him to be. Father, that you would uh, be with Kath and that she, you, she would know uh, that, that joy of being a wife to her husband, David. And Father, I pray that your blessing and your grace would abound in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for them. And Father, may their joy radiate to us as well. Amen. 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 Bless you. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. We're going to do our, our message then tonight. Here it is from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, New King James Version. Uh, a more lengthy passage than we might have, but it brings us into context here. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word of God to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they'd broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. 
And some of the scribes who were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, uh, were sitting there reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus with themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven to you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of God, Son of Man, has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take your bed and go to your house. Immediately he took up the bed and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything quite like this. So Jesus is in Capernaum again. Um, Luke gives us the detail that he wasn't welcome in his own town of Nazareth. He's in the house. Many commentators believe that it's, uh, it's, Andrew, uh, it's, it's Simon Peter's and, and Andrew's uh, home that they're in again, uh, Peter's mother-in-law's home. So it's that house that they're in, uh, possibly. And the New King James says that he was preaching the word to them. Now, uh, if you were here the other week, we would, uh, you would have heard me talk about the word preaching that Jesus did and how it was a proclamation, a proclamation that was to be heeded. And um, that was the Greek word uh, in chapter one, but the Greek word preaching here is not the one for proclamation, uh, a message that must be heeded, but it's more like a conversation. So more accurately, Jesus was having a chat with these people. He taught in the synagogue, he'd proclaimed the good news, now he was sitting down with people in a house talking to them about God, about the Word of God. And as we've said before, probably through a lens of grace, he was interpreting the scripture not through legal eyes, but through eyes of grace. Um, and telling their people uh, the good news, the very good news. But then the four brought a paralytic before him, lowering him through the roof. And verse five says that Jesus saw their faith. Now, possibly it's the faith of the five men or the four men, as commentators argue about that. Ray Steadman, the uh, American preacher, uh, he, he puts it like this. There were four men carrying the paralytic. There was faithful Frank who said, I believe we can get this man to Jesus. There was hopeful Harry who said, I believe there is hope for this man. There was loving Larry who said, I really love this guy. I hate his sin, but I love him. And then there was determined Dan who said, let's roll, let's go for it. So I've got seven points about what these men were all beginning with C, I've pinched some of them, I've added to some of them, <laughs> so, so I'm not clever in getting the alliteration. It's only what I've read in the commentaries, but you'll appreciate that the, the content uh, is, is Ian Sharp style. First thing that I want to, to, to highlight about these men, these four men, is that they were caring and compassionate. We're not told about the background to this man, but we do know that he was paralytic. He, we, we do know that, that he, he couldn't walk. He couldn't get to see Jesus under his own steam. And I think about uh, on other occasions where people were unable to get to Jesus under their own steam. I think of blind Bartimaeus, for example, who shouted to, out to Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. And the, all the other people said, shut up to blind Bartimaeus, be quiet. We, you just keep out the way. You don't deserve to, to speak to Jesus. Now, these people were, were caring and compassionate. They didn't walk across the other side of the road like the priest and the Levite did in the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example. They didn't say, this is, this is like a leper. We don't want anything to do with him. This man is a sinner. We don't want to touch him. We don't want to go anywhere near him. He deserves what he has got. They were caring and compassionate they did not allow the paralytic to rot in the gutter. They did not walk across the other side of the road. They did not keep their distance. They cared enough about him to want to introduce him 
to Jesus. And here's an application, a very simple application for us, that all around us there are people who are hurting and in need. We may be repelled by their behaviour, but they need Jesus. They may be blind to the truth, but they need Jesus. They might be helpless to do anything about it themselves, but they need Jesus and they need someone to introduce them to Jesus. We need to be ready and caring enough to introduce people to Jesus. We need to have more than pity. The plight that you're in is awful. We need to have more than sympathy. Well, I'm so sorry that you can't walk. I'm so sorry that you're in the situation that you're in. I'm sorry, Uh, I feel for you, but I, I... Sympathy goes only so far. But compassion takes action. You don't simply have pity. You don't simply have have sympathy. You have a loving care that causes you, that convinces you to do something. And in this instance, the four men were comparing and compassionate enough, moved enough to do something about this paralytic's plight. But then I also want to think that they were crazily courageous. Courage is the opposite of timidity and fear. Others might thought that they were crazy. What do you think that you're going to carry this man all the way to see Jesus and you're going to be determined enough to tear the roof off so that Jesus can see him face to face and minister to him? You're crazy enough to think that Jesus can do something for this man. Now, Others might have tried to persuade these four men, oh, don't bother about this paralytic. It's too much trouble. It's too much like hard work just to be able to to take him to Jesus. The circumstances are against him. If you take him to Jesus, who knows that he might not want to heal him? They faced opposition, but it takes courage to help someone that nobody else wants to help. It takes courage to believe against the tide of of opinion. It takes courage to believe for something everybody else thinks is impossible. It takes courage to do something when others around you think that you are crazy. Now, I don't know about you, but I can think about circumstances where, where I've prayed for people and asked God to move in situations and all around people have been saying, there's no point, don't bother, it's it's just a waste of time. We have to be crazy enough and courageous enough to go against the tide of opinion, especially in today's world where the world will say, we're crazy to believe in Jesus. We need to have the courage to believe that with Jesus, all things are possible. The men could have been dismayed and thought there was no hope. They could have been afraid of what others might have thought and for their own reputation. But these men did not have fear. They had faith. They did something that had never been done before. I'm thinking of Noah now as well, because when God asked God to, when God asked Noah to build the ark, It had never rained before. There's going to be a flood. And all these people came round and said to Noah, you're crazy, what are you doing building an ark? What? There's going to be a flood. Eh? What's a flood? It's never rained before. Because pre-flood times, uh, the, the way of the world was different. It's never rained before. But Noah believed what God had said. And we need to be crazy enough to believe what God has said and not give up. Here's the application. I think I've already said this. We need to be courageous enough to believe when everyone around us says there's no hope. It's impossible. But then also, I think that they were cleverly creative. Once they got outside the house, they saw it was too crowded to get their friend inside. So they had to think outside of the box. And 
taking the roof off because you can't get through the front door demanded some creative thinking. What are we going to do, lads? We brought, we've got, they brought this paralytic all this way. We can't get anywhere near. We can't get through the front door. What are we going to do? And sometimes when you try to help someone, the straight, the straight uh, forward way through the front door is blocked. And so we have to find another alternative way to help them. When I have tried to help people, when I've invited people to church, when you've invited people to church, they've come up with all kinds of excuses. I've got to wash my hair, I've got to finish my homework, my computer's crashed and I've lost all my work, all my assignment and I've got to start from scratch again. Um, it, uh, my auntie's coming round, my uncle's coming round, family's coming round, all kinds of excuses are presented before you, all kinds of reasons why they don't want to be introduced to Jesus, why they don't want to come to church. So we have to be creative. That's why we're creative in thinking about these events that we have at the, the Liberal Club, uh, because people might feel more comfortable. If you don't want to come to church, come to the Liberal Club. If you don't want to, this is the whole idea about the cafe in, in the village, that it's a creative way of being able to introduce people to Jesus. And maybe, here's an application, uh, is that sometimes if people come up with a roadblock as, as why you can't help them, you can be creative and say, well, if you, if you need someone to look after the dog, I'll look after, or I'll find someone to look after your dog for you. If you need someone to babysit, I'll find a babysitter. If you need somebody to do this, I'll do that. I'll, make, I'll do everything that I can to introduce you to Jesus. We can be creative. Share the link on YouTube so that they can watch on their smart TV. Give them a book. Give them a DVD. Offer to pray for someone. And then maybe you've, you've tried to help someone for a long, long time. And all the time you, you get, get these roadblocks. You get these barriers. Well, ask the Holy Spirit, pray and ask the Holy Spirit, ask him to give you a creative way, a creative idea, a way by which you can introduce them to Jesus because they don't want to go through the front door. Let's find a way to get them in the back door or even through the roof. But then also I want you to notice that these men were committed they, they stayed committed to the man even when there were roadblocks. So when they approached the house, they could have said, Deary me, have you, have you seen the crowds outside this house? Let's just turn back home. We're never going to get to see Jesus. There's too many people. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, this was a number of years ago. A girl and I decided that we were going to go to Meadow Hall uh, for the New Year's sales. It must have, I don't know whether it was before Joshua was born or whether he was very young. I know it was a long time ago now because we've never done it since. Uh, and and uh, we got to Meadow Hall and about three or four miles before Junction 34, there was a queue. You know in that feeder lane that goes down to that? There was a queue uh, and the traffic was slowing down towards that. It was, it was New Year. Everybody was still on holiday. There was no, there was no uh, works traffic. There was no commuter traffic. Everybody was still on holiday. And uh, we, Gal and I looked at one another and said, what's this? And it suddenly dawned, us, dawned on us, this is the queue for Meadow Hall. So we, we just drove past went to the next junction and came straight back. We gave up because we weren't going to queue. We weren't going to wait. But these men didn't give up when they saw the crowd. They didn't say, oh, no. You see, carrying a man, a paralytic, even though there were four of them, would have been hard work up and down the hills and, you know, ever, ever tried to move a piano, you know, ever tried to carry somebody on a stretcher? I could imagine it, it, it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of hard work. And they could have said, we, could have, we have come so far, going that extra mile might now is just, is just that mile too much. But these men were committed. 
And I want to encourage you, here's the, here's the application. Maybe you've tried to introduce someone to Jesus for a long time. Maybe it's taken a lot of hard work over the years and you are almost there, but still so far. And you might think, well, let's just turn around and go back home. I want to encourage you, don't give up on the people that you are trying to reach for Jesus. Don't give up on the people that you're trying to introduce for, to Jesus. Remain committed to that cause. They're not too much trouble. But then also, uh, some of these points morph into one another. They were men of conviction. And that's why they were committed, I think, because they believed if only we could get him to Jesus, he will be healed. They knew that if they got him to Jesus, he would be healed. It was, reminds me of the, the woman who had the issue of blood, and she said, if only I just touched the tassel of Jesus, the hem of his garment, then I will be healed. These men were convinced that with God, nothing was impossible. They had heard probably Jesus. They had seen Jesus. They said, come on, look, this man is healing the sick. He's casting out demons. He's preaching a message of grace. Come and say, if we take you to Jesus, you're going to stand up on your feet again. They were convinced that Jesus was the answer. And I believe that when we are convinced that Jesus is the answer to the people's needs around us, then we won't give up. They were clearly convicted. But then also, these men were men of cooperation. They weren't just doing it on their own. It just wasn't one man. It was four men who brought the paralytic. Two probably wouldn't have been able to help. It needed four, a corner on each corner of the stretcher. It took a bit of uni unity and a bit of cooperation. I mentioned moving a piano earlier on. I don't know whether you've ever moved a piano in your, in your life. Uh, I, I've, well, when we moved 30 odd years ago, uh, we had to move a piano and uh, there were four of us moving in and it was hard work and it was one, two, three, heave kind of idea. It needed cooperation. One of us couldn't just decide to go home and leave the rest to it. All four were needed. And the point that I'm getting round to now is that we need others in the church to help us. When we are introducing people to Jesus, we can't always do it on our own. We need the cooperation of others. You need the support of someone else to reach them. Maybe you need the support of someone else when you visit someone because you don't want to go on your own. Maybe you're seeking to help someone and you promise to cut, cut their hedge or something like that and you need someone to hold the ladder. Maybe you've offered someone transport somewhere but you need someone else to help them in the car. The list could go on and on but that's why as a church we need to cooperate and help one another. I have somebody that I want to introduce to Jesus, but I can't do it on my own. I need someone to help me. Will you help me? Maybe you might be encouraged to think about asking someone else in the church to help you as you reach out to people. If nothing else, you can say, I'm, I'm really praying, I'm really uh, reaching out to, to trying to reach out and encourage uh, one of my neighbours, will you agree with me in prayer for them? That God will give me the right words, that he will give me the right initiative, that he will give me the right strategy to be able to invite them and the right approach, the right words to say, will you pray for me? Will you encourage me in that way? Can you cooperate with me? Will you agree with me in Jesus' name? We need the encouragement and support of one another. Ask someone to help you. But then lastly of the seven points, beginning with C, they counted the cost. It will certainly cost you something 
to bring someone to Jesus. To introduce someone to Jesus will cost you something. For the men, not only did it cost them the hard effort and the hard graft to carry him all the way to the house, but it cost them the cost of the repairing the roof. Now, the scripture doesn't go into detail, but I could imagine that these men just didn't tear the roof off and at the end of the day, walk away and said, oh, claim it on your insurance or let somebody else put it back together. I would have thought that if they were caring enough and compassionate enough as they were about the paralytic, they would have been caring and caring enough about the damage that they'd done to the roof as they tore it apart so they could lower the man down. They counted the cost. They were prepared to pay the cost. Introducing someone to Jesus will cost you time, might cost you money, it will cost you your time and energy, it will cost you your favourite TV show, it will cost you... Luke 14, 33, and the message says this, simply put, if you're not willing to take what it is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. I think these men showed that they were willing to pay the price to introduce someone to Jesus. So, they, they were caring and compassionate, they were committed, they counted the cost, they were clearly convicted. What were the other ones? I can't remember them off the top of my head now, we'll review in a minute. But they did so because they wanted to introduce somebody to Jesus. It's a model for us to follow. In our minutes that we've got left, let's just look at these last verses. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your son, your <laughs> son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, in those days, it was thought that if you were ill, if you were sick, if you were paralysed, well, then it was because of something that you had done. Sometimes we, we get a carryover of that in, in, in religious thinking today. In fact, somebody rang me up earlier on in the week and something had gone wrong in their life and they said, do you think that it is something that I have done wrong? As if God was punishing them for doing something that they shouldn't have done. And the idea in Bible times was, certainly at the time of Jesus, was that, aha, you must have done something really bad if you are suffering like this. So the paralysed man would have been lowered through the roof thinking to himself, I've committed some dreadful sins in my life and they would have been a roadblock in his mind to him being healed. Jesus removes that roadblock straight away. Your sins are forgiven. There is no reason why you cannot be healed. And it's important for us to recognise that truth as well because Jesus died on the cross for our sin. Even when the enemy whispers in our ears that you do not deserve to be healed because you are rotten so-and-so, look what you've done because that's what the enemy does. He whispers in our ears that all the things that we've done in our past uh, mean that we are rotten people and that we are not worthy to receive healing. Jesus speaks those same words, words to us. Your sins are forgiven. I don't treat you according to your behaviour, but I treat you according to my grace. And God doesn't treat us according to our behaviour. You've heard me say this before. He, he, he treats us according to what Jesus has done for us. God's grace is not based upon our goodness or our badness, if you like, but upon God's goodness, upon the goodness, the perfect life of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And Jesus says to this man, your sins are forgiven. There is absolutely no reason why you cannot receive the healing that I have for you today. 
And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And actually, this is a good, just a, a good Bible verse for the Jehovah's Witnesses because this verse actually demonstrates that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God himself because only God can forgive sins. And the fact that Jesus forgave the man's sins proves that he is God. They reason this man forgiving sins, he must be, bla be um, blaspheming, but he wasn't. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier for the, to say to the paralytic, your sons are sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But so that you know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Now, the commentators are divided up on this, but this is what I think. What is it easier to say? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? I think it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, uh, your sins are forgiven because you, you can't see an immediate result. Both are humanly impossible to do, but it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, forgiven because there isn't a way to discern if that happens. But you can see if the chap's healed. It, therefore, it must be harder to say be healed because we could immediately see whether or not it came to pass. So Jesus did that which was the hardest thing to say to prove uh, that he had the power to do that which was the easier to say. If you can do the greater, then you can certainly do the lesser. Last verse. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. We never saw anything like this. Um, they were amazed. They were flabbergasted. Besides themselves, we've never seen anything like this. The message puts it like this. Um, uh, they rubbed their eyes, stunned, and then praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. But then, so that was, the, the scripture here is sort of pointing, to, or, or the way that the translators have put it, is it's what we have seen with our physical eyes. We've never seen anything like this. But then when I looked at my Greek dictionary, I noticed that it's not only to see with our physical eyes, but to perceive with our minds. And another way that we could look at it is not only as, wow, we've never seen anybody get off a stretcher before, but we have never perceived the grace of Jesus, the grace of God before. We've never fully understood that our sins are forgiven. Wow. We thought that God was out to get us. But now we realise, now we see that God is for us. And they were amazed. We've never heard, we've never seen anything like this ever before. Never before had they perceived and understood this, this spiritual truth. Jesus doesn't treat this man according to his behavior, but according to his grace. So let's wrap up. This, uh, this, is, account, uh, this is an account of men who have caring and compassionate faith, a courageous, crazy faith, a committed faith with clear conviction, a faith willing to count the cost, men who are willing to join their faith and agree, cooperate together to see this man healed. They are a model for us to follow. But before we go, we've talked about the four men, and maybe you feel like the man on the stretcher, and you need the crazy faith of others who have a clear conviction that Jesus is the answer. You need help and support, others who will stand with you before Jesus so that you too will perceive with your own eyes, with your own spiritual eyes, the truth that God is gracious, 
He doesn't treat you as, your, as you deserve according to your behavior, but according to his grace and according to his unmerited favor. And if you say, I need someone just to carry and support me and agree with me, pray for me, well, we'll gladly pray for you at the end of the service. Make your way to the front and we'll, we'll agree with you. Because God is gracious. If you're at home and you want prayer, call me, email me, phone me up. We'll have the numbers and the email address in a moment. Um, and we'll gladly pray with you and for you. We are caring and compassionate enough to bring you before Jesus and introduce you to him and to his grace. And his grace will abound and flow. Amen. Thank you, Gal.
hallelujah. Lord, we are people who are crazy enough and courageous enough to believe that with you, nothing is impossible. We are crazy enough and courageous enough. We are clearly and utterly convicted that you want to help the people that, who are our friends who don't know you. We know that you are the answer to their mess. We know that the, you are the answer to their deepest need. And Father, help us to be cleverly creative. Inspire us by your Holy Spirit so that we can introduce them to Jesus. May we cooperate with one another. May we be willing to count the cost, pay the cost, so that people come into a living relationship with you and their lives are changed forever. Father, may we not be people who walk on the other side of the road or tell people to be quiet or people who say we can't be bothered, it's not worth our time. Father, may we be people who are compassionate and caring and see your glory revealed in their lives. Amen. Don't forget, if you want us to pray for you, we'll pray for you now. If you want us to pray for you and you're at home watching on this on your TV, give us a call 01484 323 978. You can call me on my mobile 0747 277 3243. You can email me at info at hvelim.org.uk. Oh, it's been nice to see you this evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. And don't forget that we love you, God loves you, and that we are blessed, blessed by the best. See you again soon. Amen. <laughs>